appreciate, John, you leaving your toothpick up here on the pulpit for me to use. Um, might be the first time. No, I'll keep it because I'm going to have barbecue for lunch. I'm, I may need one. I won't be using yours, though, I promise. I am a bit more hungry right now than I was before the service began. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I know I speak on behalf of Pastor Tom. We often, almost every week, talk about how great our church family is. We just love you guys, and we thank you for praying for us, letting us come alongside of you and minister with you. We have some of the best laymen uh, Tom and I have ever had. We've often said that, and uh, it's just a privilege to be a part of this church family. Well, over the last 28 weeks, if you've been here this long, uh, you know that I've been preaching through the Bible, the major stories of the Bible. The series is called The Story, and there, there is a, a storyline that we have watched and heard over and over and over. I think I've said it at least 28 times, if not more. So you know what I'm going to say, what the storyline of the Bible is, and that is that God desires to have fellowship, warm fellowship with us, just as he intended at the very beginning in the garden, that same fellowship that he had with Adam and Eve, that they absolutely loved that relationship with God, and God loved it with them. That's his desire for us even today. Well, we saw that fellowship from the very beginning. As God created Adam and Eve, he had fellowship with them in the cool of the day. Unfortunately, they broke that fellowship because they decided to, they wanted to serve themselves instead of serve God, and they were forced out of that fellowship. They were forced out of the garden, and they had to deal with the ramifications of that decision. Sin entered the world. Splinters entered the finger. Death, birth, all of the challenges that we now have to deal with. And we saw that goal of fellowship, though, as God continued this, this relationship with his creation. We saw the goal of fellowship as God created a covenant with Abraham that his descendants would be, would be blessed and that they would mirror the holiness of God so that others around would recognize who God was. We saw God's desire for fellowship when he sheltered the Israelites from a destructive drought early on in the about the middle part of Genesis and 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 even though they had to be slaves for about 400 years God still provided protection as that that small community of Israelites grew and got stronger even in as they were imprisoned they were enslaved in Egypt it was God protecting his people desiring to have that fellowship and God's desire for fellowship showed up again when he began to provide a, a, an opportunity for a tabernacle and then for a temple, for, for God's people to be in his presence. He called his people to come to the tabernacle or to the temple so that they could be in, in fellowship with each other again. They could be in God's presence and the sacrificial system that he provided gave them an opportunity to be forgiven. So that fellowship relationship continued. The temple and the tabernacle was designed by God himself to bring the Israelites into fellowship, into worship, into the presence of God. It was God's gift to them. But the people of Israel once again desired their own way. They chose to serve a king instead of God. Unfortunately, all of their kings didn't serve the creator and led them into sin and finally destruction. Solomon's temple, which represented God's presence in Israel, was destroyed. And even during their divided kingdom and finally their imprisonment in other countries, God still showed them, even while they were outside of God's promised land, even when they were in 
imprisonment in other countries that he desired to have fellowship with them by providing them prophets that would speak truth to them even while they were running for their lives. God was speaking truth to them. Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel called out to the broken people of Israel that God was still in love with them. God still wanted fellowship with them. So he provided truth speakers to them. But even in their pain, even in their suffering and separation from their promised land, God protected them. God provided prophets and direction. And finally, some of the tribes, two out of the ten tribes, limped back to Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. There was a lengthy time of silence. They began to build the, the, the temple back and they began to build Jerusalem back. But then there was this lengthy time of silence from God. Around 400 years of silence would make the Israelites hungry for the fellowship that they once had from God. No prophets spoke. No angels spoke. There were no miracles. They waited and they hungered. The time would come. Just as he promised. When God would provide for his creation a Messiah. He had promised it many, many times. Jesus would be born just like them. He would be tempted just like them, yet without sin. He suffered all of the same challenges that they did every single day. Their Messiah would do what no sacrificial lamb could ever do. Jesus took their sins, past, present, and future, and died once for all. He paid the penalty for their sin. His death his resurrection brought them back into fellowship with God once again if they by faith received the gift that he offered. And that's where we are in this story. Christ has lived. He died. Last Sunday we talked about his resurrection. Now he has made a promise to them that if they would wait... He was going to give them the power of the Holy Spirit. And in these next several weeks, we're going to hear what happens to the church when Peter and John and the other disciples, after they've received the empowerment of the, of the Holy Spirit, what has happened to the church, how it begins to explode and expand all over that area. And Peter begins to uh, begins to plant churches. He was like the key church planter in that area. And then Paul comes about and he's, he's the key theologian in, during that time. And he's now writing letters and visiting churches and leaving instructions to the new church about what was important as they come back into fellowship with God. The new church became witnesses to the fellowship of God in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the ends of the earth. It's the story of the fellowship. It's God's desire from the very beginning, even before he created us, mankind. He desired to have fellowship with us. And through the whole story of the Old Testament, and yes, even in the New Testament, his desire is to bring us back into fellowship with him. So I would like for us to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about how the Holy Spirit empowered the church to explode in effectiveness and growth and what it means personally to you and me. So in honor of reading God's word, would you please stand? And I'm going to read Acts chapter 1, 4 through 11. My friends, what I'm about to read to you is life-changing, I promise you. If you'll listen to the word, if you'll apply it, 
if you'll allow God's fellowship to work out in you that he teaches us in the word, it will radically change your life, I promise. So listen, in honor of reading God's word, listen very carefully. Acts chapter 1, 4 says, Luke is writing, by the way, in my former book, Theophilus, who's writing the book for him. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, even or after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. and You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this... He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The book of Acts has two primary themes, and chapter 1, verse 8 states them very clearly. The first uh, primary theme is power for ministry, and the second was expansion of the ministry. So standing out on the hillside of the Mount of Olives, Jesus knew they needed to catch just a few extremely important details as he ascends into heaven. The first thing that he really needed them to understand was that you will receive an amazing power from God himself. Don't assume, I need you to understand that don't assume that the Holy Spirit has just showed up in the New Testament alone. This isn't, uh, this isn't a concept that is a shock to them about the Holy Spirit. In fact, the power of the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament as well. His power was first seen in the act of Creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we see the very first time the Trinity shows up. The, the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So he shows up at the very beginning of the creation. And his power was promised to provide healing and guidance Multiple times, we see it in Zechariah chapter 36, where it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's the Holy Spirit at work even in the Old Testament. And also he empowered men and women in the Old Testament. So David was given the power to become the anointed king, the scripture says. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And, and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. That was the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Bezalel was given the power of wisdom and skill. 
See, I've chosen Bezalel, and I've filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills. He, was, he, he had the skills to help create a beautiful uh, temple of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit was gifting him to do that. Joshua was given the power to lead the Israelites. Samson was given the power of the strength. So don't think that the Holy Spirit is a new concept in the New Testament. God was, Jesus wasn't saying, I'm going to give you something brand new that you don't know about. But in the Old Testament, the, the presence and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was localized at best. That's probably not a, a great word, but the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was only often for only very specific people for a short time to accomplish a specific task. But don't think that the Holy Spirit was not work in the Old Testament. He was even involved in the, the, the creation of the universe. But what Jesus was asking them to wait for was something absolutely different and unexpected of what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was promised in the New Testament to empower the disciples. All of those, not just the 11 that were present, but for all of those who were disciples of Christ. John the Baptist said, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So they were empowered to perform miracles. After Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, it said, and awe came upon every soul. And with many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So God empowered them with the Holy Spirit to perform miracles. Do things that they never thought that they would ever do. And they were empowered to teach. They stood before government leaders and expounded the gospel story to defend this new church with tremendous success. I love Peter's sermon in chapter 2. Throughout 1 through 7, you'll see multiple times the disciples, especially Peter and John, speaking truth to people that would can be considered their enemies. And they spoke it boldly. Why? Because the Holy Spirit empowered them, gave them everything that they needed. And they were empowered with wisdom. These were mere fishermen. They weren't very educated. They did not have great training. They did not have great experience. And Peter, a fisherman, became a church planter for the new church all over that area. Paul became a theologian for this new church. God empowered them with great wisdom and learning. And they were empowered to heal. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were headed towards the temple. A man who was crippled at, from birth was put there to beg every day, begging them for money. And they respond, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And instantly, the man began to walk, and then to run, and then to jump. And the people, it said, the people were filled with wonder and amazement. How did this happen? I'll tell you. They waited for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The apostles were empowered with the ability to witness with amazing success. Throughout Acts, there was an explosion in the church. And I would encourage you just to do a quick review of, of Acts. And I, I've used a, a highlighter and every time in the book of Acts, it talks about the explosion or the growth of the church. I've highlighted it. So many times, even especially in the first half of, of Acts, you'll see multiple times. It says 3,000 became believers at Pentecost. 
And in chapter 2, people were being added to the church daily. In chapter 4, it says 5,000 men plus women and children. And in chapter 5, it says multitudes were being saved. In chapter 6, it says religious leaders were being converted. In chapter 9, it says entire towns commit, were committed to Christ and on and on and on. Acts In Acts, it talks about this explosion of the church that happened when it was after the Holy Spirit empowered them to expand the church. The power of the Holy Spirit was not a quiet event at Pentecost. We see the story in Acts chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Can you imagine the roar of the wind as the Holy Spirit blew, just as a mighty wind it was described? Can you imagine this brilliance of light as it seemed like the flames of fire rested on the heads of the apostles? The Holy Spirit empowered them to speak in other languages so that people from at least 15 different countries that were present could understand the gospel in their own language. I challenge you to go to chapter 2 and just list out every single language or country that was present. The scripture says all of them heard the gospel in their own language and they understood the gospel. That would have been an amazing service to be a part of. And then many were saved because of the power of the Holy Spirit. On Pentecost, 3,000 were attracted to the gospel. Through miraculous hearing of the gospel in their own tongues, they heard it for the very first time, and they understood it. And it was being spoken by disciples who had never spoken that language before. The Holy Spirit did that. After Peter and John healed the lame man at the temple gate, a crowd gathered and and began to preach. They began to preach the gospel. And the scripture says 5,000 came to Christ because of that healing. How? It was the Holy Spirit. Peter's shadow healed some and demons were cast out and believers were added to the church. Many believed in Joppa because Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Many, many other miracles. How? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't the wisdom of these fishermen. It wasn't because of their experience. It wasn't because of their education. Certainly, it was the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that they waited for. None of the miracles saved anyone. Let me be clear. None of the miracles saved anyone. But they were accompanied by persuasive preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Truth-telling occurred. And by faith, people trusted Jesus to forgive them. Romans chapter 1 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone Who believes? Now, here's an important question for us. If the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples then, does he still desire to empower us today, the current disciples? Does he still desire, through the Holy Spirit, to give us wisdom? Does God still want to anoint us for service? Does he still desire to heal people through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit still cast out demons? Does the Holy Spirit still want to see hundreds of people 
saved us. They still want to see communities radically changed because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The answer is yes. He still wants to do that today. It's not just something that happens in the book of Acts. Jesus wanted them to understand something else. You will minister an ever-increasing influence. Scripture says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The disciples were powerful in witness only because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Powerful in witness if they waited for the Holy Spirit to come on them. Remember, verse 4 says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father, the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So wait. And they would be powerful in witness if they absolutely and were totally sold out. You see, this word witness is often used in our legal system. And we have multiple ways to describe types of witness. There's the eyewitness. That's someone who has firsthand knowledge of something that has just occurred. There is an expert witness. They're often paid for their services. So they might hire a medical doctor to be a witness concerning a certain device or maybe a certain disease and witness that, that understanding in court. There's a hostile witness. That's someone who really doesn't want to witness, but they've promised that they will tell the truth, and you can kind of see it in their face. They really don't want to be there. They're hostile. But this word witness means so much more when we understand it with its original meaning. In fact, I'm going to use a Greek word that you probably all totally use yourself. The Greek word for witness is martyr. The Greek word for witness is spelled M-A-R-T-Y-R. And we know what that word means. It doesn't mean that we're all, because we're witnesses for Christ, are going to go out and give our lives for Christ. That doesn't know that that isn't what that means, but it does mean that we are willing to go all out, withholding nothing from God, to be sold out to be his witnesses. The power and effectiveness of our witness is often determined by whether we are willing to lay down everything at the altar in order to witness for Christ. We are willing to give up our reputation. We are willing to give of our money and our resources. We're willing to give up our time so that we can be, mart I mean, witnesses. Can you imagine the difference in our witness scene if we were willing to be a martyr? Giving up everything that is important to us for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The disciples were powerful in ever-increasing geographical areas of influence. In verse 8 it says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This explained how the disciples, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, would be moving the church from where they were to the very corners of the earth very quickly. The listing of these geographical areas weren't, it wasn't by accident. 
The disciples understood what Jesus was, was saying. Jerusalem, he said, you'll go to Jerusalem, and they knew that represented their home. It was where they were most comfortable being, in their own neighborhood, where it was safe. People knew their name, they knew the culture and the language, and they weren't uncomfortable there. That was the place that they're comfortable. So for us, it might be our own houses, our own neighborhoods, the, the town that we live in that we're most comfortable. And then he says, not just Jerusalem, but Judea. And that represented a larger ge geographical area, but it's still in our comfort zone. It's still relatively safe. For, for the disciples, that was still areas that spoke their own Hebrew language, and it was their own culture. It might be them going to another town or, or maybe a, across the way, but it was, they, they still understood the culture. And for us here in the United States, that, that uh, Judea might still be within the United States, maybe within the God-fearing country that we enjoy. But then he goes on and he says, it will also, you will go into Samaria. And that began to strike just a little fear in their hearts, perhaps, because it represented those who were different than they were. In Samaria, they had created their own religion by taking just a little of, of Judaism and, and a little idolatry and kind of mixing them all together. And, and so Jews weren't even to go into that area. They had different worship practices and a different definition of God and they had their own temple and they saw scriptures totally different than the Jews. But Jesus was saying, the Holy Spirit will empower you to even go into Samaria. And for those of us right here, it might be for us to step out of our comfort, uh, comfortable houses and our own community and even out of our comfortable uh, culture where we live here in the United States. And we might move into an area that might make us uncomfortable, maybe into a, 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 commun a community of Buddhists or maybe Muslims or, or maybe into a, a gangbanger situation where we are perhaps uncomfortable with what is going on, maybe into another country where it's the culture and language is totally different. Jesus is saying, I'm going to empower you so that you can take the church there. But he doesn't end there. He goes, I'm going to empower you to go to the ends of the earth. And it represented other countries far away from their comfort zone and far from their culture and from their language. And they did. They went to Northern Europe. They went to India. They went to Central Europe, they went all the way to Spain, the scripture says. These disciples that heard Jesus talk and, get, and tell them to wait for the Holy Spirit, they went there. And for us, that might mean traveling totally on the opposite side of the world. Being missionaries in a different culture, a different place that is perhaps not a comfortable place to live and minister, certainly to be a Christian, God says, I'm going to empower you to even go and be effective there. Some of you are thinking right now, well, pastor, I, I can't go to Zimbabwe to witness right now. I don't even speak the language. But you can make it a practice to go to the same Ethiopian restaurant every month so that you can get to know that one waiter. You can invite your neighbors over and have pie together, or perhaps some really good barbecue, just to get to know the neighbors that might speak a different language, or maybe, maybe they speak your language, but their faith is not, they're, they're believing a lie, and you would have the opportunity to just love on them on the front porch, just talking for years, perhaps, before you even have the privilege of having a relationship where you can invite them to Christ. You, should, you could start visiting the local gym and pray that God would choose somebody for you to befriend. 
And throughout that relationship, you're praying for the Holy Spirit to empower you. You're waiting for wisdom. You're expecting the Holy Spirit to show up, and you're willing to be used at any time. Remember, Lord, I open my hands and inviting you to take out of my hands or put into my hands whatever you know to be best. What would happen if every single day we truly prayed that and believed it and expected it? I have to ask that question as it relates to this passage. If Christ was speaking to his followers of that day concerning the need of the Holy Spirit to empower them, why would we ever believe that he was not speaking to us as well? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And you will be my witnesses in Judea. And you will be my witnesses in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So my question is, have you ever purposely waited for God's total and complete infilling? When was the last time you purposely asked God to empower you with the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you told God, no matter what, you were going to be a martyr, a, a witness for him not holding anything back. I'm just wondering if that is all God is waiting for before he infills you with the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you please stand? There's a story that I'm confident in the last three years I've probably told you before, but it's so moving. I wanted to remind us about the Osbournes who were missionaries in India back in the 1950s. They were new missionaries and they they really didn't understand the moving of the, they didn't understand the, the spirit world or the power that was available to them by the Holy Spirit. They were new Christians. They just didn't understand what was going on. They felt like failures for the few years that they were there in India. They tried to best, their best to explain the gospel using the words of, of the Bible. They believed the Bible. But there is a large Muslim community in India we don't talk about that very often, but there, was, there is. But the Muslims, when they would hear these missionaries pull out their Bible and say, the Bible says this, the Muslims would pull out their holy book, the Quran, and show the, the gold letters on the spine of their book too. And they would, they would explain that their book was true too. Both holy books were bound with black leather and and had fancy words in it and so their god must be right as well the osbornes had absolutely no fruit in the first several years that they were there they went back to the united states for a planned furlough for a year and they decided they knew that they were going to have to pray and fast and decide whether they would even go back Uh, to India in ministry. Nothing was working, so they needed to figure this out. They happened to go to a, a revival where they met an evangelist who preached with such anointing, such authority. He had such great wisdom. And besides that, people in the service was being healed. Demons were being cast out of people. Lives were radically changed. People were convicted of their sins and they were accepting Christ and their lives were radically changed. Marriages were being healed. Addictions were being removed. Miracles. They were just amazed night after night after night. 
The Osbournes decided right then and there they were going to go to the Word and they were going to begin to read the New Testament with brand new eyes. He wrote, he, he writes, the husband, whatever Jesus told us to do as his followers, we were going to do. I can never tell you what that step meant to us. The Bible became a living, pulsating, thrilling book of truth. They went back to India, and guess what? Revival broke out. Thousands of people came to Christ. People were being healed from diseases. Demons were being cast out of people. Their ministry had a radical anointing of the Holy Spirit. Why? I think you know. Because they actually invited and allowed the Holy Spirit to infill them. They believed that the Holy Spirit is powerful. And he wanted to be powerful in their lives if they only would invite him. So my question is the same. Would you be willing to purposely invite the Holy Spirit's complete control over you and expect then to be used? Maybe that's all God is waiting for. So what does it mean to receive the power of the Holy Spirit? It means that it is an act of faith. It's not something that you can work for. It's not something that you can read enough good books for. It is an act of faith, believing that the Holy Spirit desires to infill you. It is also a complete act of dedication. Not holding anything back, becoming a martyr, a witness, totally giving everything to him. You hear me often say, my hands are wide open. And I invite you, Father, to take out of my hands or put into my hands whatever you know to be best. That is an act of me and, and us inviting the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants. I'm not holding anything back. You can have it. You can have my house. You can have my time. My bank account, my education, my health, my family is totally yours to be used in any way you so desire. It's an act of martyrdom. It's giving my life to him. And it's also both a private and a public decision. It's private in that only you can make that decision. It's a personal decision that you make. But can I also tell you, it, it is and must be a public decision. It's your public testimony that we are totally sold out to God. Holding nothing back. That God is welcome to use you in any way that he wants and you want everybody to know, just like baptism is never a private event where it's just the pastor and a person being baptized hidden. It is a public event say, stating, I have accepted Christ as my personal Savior. It is my public testimony. So is receiving the Holy Spirit. Personally, I've invited the Holy Spirit, but I want the whole world to know that I am totally sold out to him. We're going to sing a song. And I just need you to know that the altar is a place where historically God's people come and meet with him. And if you're serious about committing your life and work to the Holy Spirit, I would dare say that it is a personal decision, but it's also 
a personal decision that we make publicly. So as we sing this song, I'd just like to invite you, if you'd like to be totally used of God, I'd invite you to come down to the altar. And I can tell you, I'm going to be coming down to the altar, even though I feel like I have done this many, many times in my life. It is a public testimony that once again, I am telling the Father, I am giving my all to you. I'm waiting for you to empower me. I'm waiting for you to to work through me. I give you myself as a martyr for you. It's yours. So I will be coming down. And I hope that you would come as an act of faith, as an act of uh, of dedication, as we all make a private decision and a public decision to invite the Holy Spirit to come. As we sing this song, I just invite you to join me as we invite the Holy Spirit to empower us this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, recognizing that we can do nothing on our own. We don't have power within ourselves. We don't know the truth. We can't do anything to expand the church. We can't do anything to see healing in marriages and addictions broken. We don't have the ability to command demons to be removed and truth to replace darkness, but you do. So, Father, you have told us to wait, and we are waiting. And by faith, we are inviting you to empower us, to infill us, so that we might know the truth, that we might speak boldly, that where there is darkness, light will go before us and we would be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for our communities. We pray for our own homes. We pray that our families and those that we love and those that we work with will know that there's something different about us because the Holy Spirit has empowered us and will speak the truth. And Father, as we step out into our communities where we're still comfortable and we understand and know where people live and we know the language and the culture, I pray, Father, that our community will look at those people who go to that church. They mirror something. They know the truth there. They speak with kindness. 
there's something different about them. And I pray that as they look to our church, they will know that we are mirroring the holiness of God. And Father, as we step into our Samarias, where we're uncomfortable, where we might meet people that are different than us, they look different, they speak a different language and different culture, and they have different belief systems, speak to us. Because there there are communities right here in Topeka that we're not prepared to go unless your Holy Spirit empowers us. Give us wisdom as we speak to them on the streets, at the gas stations, at our job, at the school. Father, that we might be able to speak truth into their lives. And then, Father, as we go to the uttermost parts of the world, different places that we don't understand even a little, we go with fear and trepidation only because we know we can't do it ourselves. We ask, Father, that you would empower us. And Father, we thank you that we are making both a private and a public decision to follow you. And Father, we want you to know that our time now is yours. Our resources, our wallets, our bank accounts, they're yours. You know best. Father, our, our kids, they're yours, our health, our marriage, our jobs, We take our hands off of our education. All the things that we don't understand, we we take our hands off of them and we ask that we would be used in, in ways to expand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Might the church of Jesus Christ be proclaimed wherever we are? And we want you to know, Father, that we recognize that it is only through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that you will do something amazing through those of us who recognize that we must be martyrs for Christ. So, Father, we stand waiting, inviting, expecting you to do something in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join us as we sing this song of prayer? Spirit of oh, the living God, yes, Jesus, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Do you receive this benediction? Paul gives this benediction to the believers in Ephesus. And might it be your benediction as well. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of of God. So now, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, for he's already gone before you. You're dismissed.